Good morning and welcome to our program, A Matter of Life and Death, Researching North Carolina Vital Records. I am Francesca Prez Evans, the Community Engagement Librarian with the State Library of North Carolina. I will be your host and moderator for today's event. Please visit the State Library of North Carolina's website to learn more about the library's collection and services. You will find a link to our website in the chat box. Once the presentation has ended, we will send you a follow-up email with a list of resources mentioned in today's program. This presentation will also be recorded and made available online. Captioning will be available for this presentation. To view closed captioning in this platform, please use your mouse to hover over the control toolbar on the top or bottom of the screen and click on the closed caption button. Second, select either show subtitle or view full transcript to see the captions during the presentation. Finally, on the same toolbar, click on the chat button to bring up the chat box. Please send a message to our team if you need technical help or would like to add questions for the presenters to answer at the end of the presentation. Next, we also ask everyone to please keep their sound on mute. Without further ado, please let me introduce you to our speakers. Elizabeth Hayden is the Reference Services and Data Librarian at the Government and Heritage Library, part of the State Library of North Carolina. She began working at the State Library in 2008. She is passionate about helping people understand documents, connecting them to the past. Before coming to the State Library, she worked in public, community college, academic, and special libraries. Molly Goldston is a Reference Services Assistant at the State Library of North Carolina with the Government and Heritage Library. She earned her Master's in Library and Information Sciences from North Carolina Central University. She enjoys working with people to help them explore information and resources related to all things North Carolina. To get us started with a matter of life and death, researching North Carolina vital records presentation, please welcome Beth Hayden. Thank you all for coming today. Molly and I are going to talk to you all about vital records. When we speak about vital records, we mean records indicating birth, marriage, and death which are crucial to family history research. We will focus on the evolution of vital records in the United States and how to find North Carolina information. At the Government Heritage Library, we're frequently contacted by people wanting 18th and 19th century birth and death records. Many are shocked to learn that North Carolina didn't start keeping these until 1913. I began thinking about this and wondered how they came to be and why there was no organized system until the 20th century. This is how the idea for this webinar began. I was surprised to learn most states introduced birth and death registration laws around the same time as North Carolina in 1913. I will give you a brief overview of the evolution of vital registration in the United States, and Molly will show you how to access the North Carolina records and give you tips on what to use as substitutes. Religious institutions in Europe were the first to register christenings, marriages, and deaths. So it's no surprise the same happened in America. Here, the London Bills of Mortality summarize the birth and death information from church and parish records in England from the late 1500s through the 16 and 1700s and covered episodes of the plague. 
This compilation was published in 1759 and was known to early American scientists and scholars. In the 18th century, an interest grew in social analysis based on data. In colonial times, there were early attempts to record vital information, but few records survive. Initially, colonists were not interested in births, marriages, and deaths because most people lived in small communities and, and everyone knew what was going on with their neighbors. But as the population increased, towns grew into cities and epidemics broke out, the public became more interested. Early American newspaper editors noted this and started to publish numbers from church and town records. Virginia and Massachusetts established birth, marriage, and death registrations in the 1630s, but laws and decrees were rarely enforced. Here is the 1669, the Fundamental Constitutions of Carolina, drawn up by Locke, John Locke, and issued by the Lord's Proprietors of the Carolinas. It mentions, there shall be a registry in every signiary, signiory, barony, and colony, wherein shall be recorded all births, marriages, and deaths that shall happen within the respective signiaries, baronies, and colonies. And this can be found in the colonial and state records of North Carolina. Interest in demography grew in Europe and America during the 18th century. One of, if not the first regular newspapers, the Boston Newsletter, published charts of people buried in Boston and separated the information by race in the early 1700s. A 20 year summary was published in 1721 of Boston burials. It lists the deaths and burials during epidemics um, and those were of particular interest to the public. In the 1720s, Dr. Zabdiel Boyston promoted inoculation for smallpox, which was unpopular with the public. And there were debates about inoculation for religious and moral grounds. He hoped the death numbers would help convince people to be inoculated. And also a little later on, Benjamin Franklin used statistics in his newspaper and almanacs. This slide shows a 1790 British-made jug sold commercially to Americans to commemorate the first census. The first census in 1790 established the use of statistics for taxation and representation. It was also written into the Constitution to be taken every decade afterward. However, there was interest in using the census to do much more from the beginning. For example, John Adams wanted population figures to warn England not to underestimate America's military strength. And Jefferson needed numbers to convince the French Amer that the American, um, of the American market's economic potential. Unfortunately, the 1790 and other early census numbers fell low and were far from complete. Other problems were there was no standard form until 1830 and area marshals who did the count created their own forms. They could also jail the same people they counted for not paying taxes or for some other reason which undermined trust. This title sums up the predominant mindset of the scientific and social reformers of the 19th century. This is the outline of the rational system of society founded on demonstrable facts, developing the first principles of the science of human nature being the only effectual remedy for the evils experienced by the population of the world, the gradual adoption of which would tranquilize the present agitated state of society, and relieve it from moral and physical evil by removing the causes which produce them. The period after the Revolutionary War had stimulated humanitarian concern for health. Moral and religious beliefs influenced thinkers. The 19th century saw a shift in medicine 
and science focused on the betterment of humanity by correcting the supposed moral failings, especially the evils of liquor, and the unhealthy environments in which some people lived. It was a time of both rapid population and industrial growth. In addition, there was the rise of fraternal, temperance, and anti-slavery movements. Scientific and medical societies debated using census data to discuss health standards and the future of the nation, although most studies did focus on the differences between races and ethnic groups. It's also interesting to point out that insurance businesses took root in, in Europe and spread to America, and this created an interest in life expectancy for all people, including the enslaved. The Industrial Revolution made more and urbanized areas and created closer living conditions, helping the spread of disease. Switching from agriculture to factories brought, brought poor work conditions, dirty air, and sewage in the streets. On the other hand, there were difficulties enumerating inhabitants in the frontier territories and, new, and, and the new states as well. And it became apparent that as the nation expanded westward, um, there, there were simply more problems and different problems. It took more work to travel and ask more detailed questions. And it was impossible to enforce registration in such a, a large area. However, European statistical study significantly increased and influenced Americans during the 1830s and 40s. And the statistical societies formed to improve humanity through data examination. Advisors to the cabinet and Congress continued to push for reform and expansion of questionnaires. And interestingly, the Boston Medical Society persuaded the Boston City Council to adopt a cause of death nomenclature and require death certificates. By 1833, five cities had regular registrations of births and deaths, and those were Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and New Orleans. From the beginning of the United States Census in the 1790s, leaders in science, government, and social reformers were interested in expanding the census. They saw great potential in gathering more information about Americans. As a result, more questions and forms were added in the second half of, of, the, of the 19th century. These new schedules or forms gathered information about agriculture, industry, slavery, deaths, veterans, and religious, correctional, mental, and other institutions. This slide shows some of the new topics introduced in those 50 years. Remember too, that names were recorded on these documents, and it is wise to look at the original copy of all census forms. During this time, The Origins of Species was published in 1859. The American Public Health Association was founded in 1872. And discoveries by Louis Pasteur and other scientists shifted the view of disease and bacteria. Tackling moral issues for reform shifted to improving health through germ theory before the turn of the century. Problems enumerators and reformers faced included Western expansion, the Civil War, migration, immigration, and Congress. The momentum behind vital, the vital records movement waned due to the Civil War. However, the war did increase public interest in public hygiene as soldiers died not only from fighting, but as from disease as well. The slave schedules show a slaveholder's name and list the enslaved by age and sex. It does not include the name of the enslaved person. There were plans to add more to the 1860 slave schedules. The Senate debated the second schedule. Reformers wanted new schedules to ask about all individuals. Southern Democrats did not want additional questions about the institution of slavery. 
Reformers wanted the new schedules to show name, age, sex, place of birth, and the number of children alive or dead for mothers. Congressman Andrew Butler of South Carolina and William King of Alabama successfully pushed to have the enslaved names, place of birth, and children removed. He argued it would be too many questions for the enumerator and deter from an accurate count. The conflict between North and South deepened tremendously through the 19th century. But anyone who has looked at a slave schedule or used them for research knows how much difference those questions could have made. Still businesses, associations, reformers, academics um, also wanted certain types of data. Since the country's colonization, settlers saw epidemics of smallpox, yellow fever, scarlet fever, and ways of cholera. Immigration was constant through the 19th century. By the 1800s, many Americans were working in manufacturing, mining, trade, transportation, or, or a service, and lived in overcrowded conditions in cities, making conditions rife for more outbreaks. Not only were the new immigrants in the ports blamed, but there is also concern their birth rate surpassed that of the existing white population. The first questions about nativity or where a person was born appeared in the census and remained a recurring question. In the 19th century, it was believed that those newly arriving immigrants were the cause of epidemics. While epidemics raged, lawmakers expanded the United States Census by adding additional separate questionnaires or schedules to examine their impact. In 1850, physicians were asked to provide the name, age, sex, cause of death, and number of days in care for those who died within a calendar year of the census enumeration. These documents are known as mortality schedules and were taken in 1850, 60, 70, 80, and um, 1885 for some areas. They were also taken, I believe in 1890 and 1900, but those schedules were destroyed. Unfortunately, they are underutilized as a vital record resource, especially since they are a rare resource showing the enslaved person's age and death. And it even no, names those, in, in, and as you can see in that column that has an S, that designate that those were enslaved people. It shows their, their age and um, it shows their name, which is unusual. And it also shows their cause of death to the, to the right. It was believed that deaths were undercounted as much as 40%. Physicians were unaccustomed to paperwork and felt, and felt inconvenienced by the new record keeping. Another problem was there was no standard for classification for death. And here, as late as 1903, the Census Bureau is trying to instruct doctors on how to define what caused deaths rather than things like old age and overwork. The final statements of 1862 to 1899 were another precursor to death certificates. They show soldiers from the U.S. infantry who died in service during that time period. They indicate personal information such as place, date, and cause of death. Sometimes they will show a birthplace next to kin and a, and a physical description. And this is the final, ish, final statement for William Bacchus, who is noted in the document as having been born in North Carolina. This record includes his age, height, physical appearance, as well as date, place, and reason for, death, for his death. It states he was killed in action fighting Indians in Hot Springs, Texas on October 28, 1880. And the remarks section gives his burial location as Hot Springs, Texas. It wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century did the Census Bureau become a, 
a permanent establishment. As one critic pointed out, we as a nation had detailed real estate transactions and registered pedigree horses, dogs, and cows long before people. Vital records were used not only for health reasons, but also as legal documentation. Another movement began to take shape in the 19th and 20th centuries that further progressed the movement, particularly for, child, for, for birth certificates, and that was child labor reform. The importance of age as a social category began to emerge following the Civil War. Unlike the early 20th century, child labor was commonly used in textile mills, mining, and other industry. The concept of childhood as a stage of life was developed during the 19th century as other institutions like the military, education, and court systems used age as a factor. Despite efforts to regulate labor by age, there was little real there was little enforcement as children's ages were difficult to determine without official documentation. Ages were also fabricated by parents so that their children work and contribute to the family. After all, children in the 18th and 19th century America could be bound into apprenticeships, even as infants. Birth records were the only way to enforce child labor laws that protected children from entering the workforce in what were often dangerous and unhealthy conditions at such a young age. In addition to birth records being used as legal documentation to protect children, they also became necessary in order to receive benefits from social security and other welfare initiatives created through President Roosevelt's New Deal program. Birth certificates were required as proof of citizenship for all defense industry workers too, especially during, the, the, during World War II. Another outcome of the Second World War was the desire to create a better coordinating system between state and national entities. Federal functions and vital statistics were often granted, were, were excuse me, officially granted in 1944 with the Public Health Act which gave legislative authority for federal government to collect vital statistics, and it helped create the National Office of Vital Statistics. The development and implementation of vital records and statistics movement faced many challenges. An article about the lack of consistency in, in classification and collection methods was published in the American Journal of Public Health in 1913, written by Cressy Wilbur, a prominent statistician during this time. Knowing which year a state has records on file is important for researchers studying genealogy, public health, history, sociology, and much more. These records can provide a snapshot of what was occurring in an area at a specific time in history. Why were there more deaths or births during a particular year than others? For genealogists researching a person prior to the registration year, creative skills are needed to search other records that may contain the information they're looking for. The table on the left-hand side comes from the National Center for Health Statistics report and shows how the implementation of vital record keeping varies by state. For example, Massachusetts began statewide registration of deaths and births in 1841, while Illinois started in 1916. Towns and counties in certain states may have documented these events far earlier. Massachusetts vital records date back to 1639 when it was still a colony. While most recent addition to this list is the United States Territory, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands in 1946. In the second column, it has a set of dates titled admitted to the registration area. These dates refer to a concept developed by John Shaw Billings, first proposed in 1880 
as a solution to the problem of collecting data on a national level. The registration area was, was composed of cities and states where vital registration systems were already in place. Today, the legal authority to record births, deaths, and other vital records, such as marriage and divorce, resides within 57 jurisdictions. These include all 50 states, two cities, Washington, D.C., and New York, and five U.S. territories. To counter one of the most serious problems facing this movement, the lack of standards on all levels of operation, a national standard certificate form for each vital event was developed by the federal government for adoption by the states. This has eliminated the confusion which characterized the early days of registration when every locality produced its own and in a different form. The Model State Vital Statistics Act was revised many times in the 20th century to promote and maintain nationwide uniformity in the vital, in the system of vital statistics. Now that we have some historical context for the events that contributed to the vital records movement, let's dive into how it's organized. It really is an all hands on deck system that requires coordination between healthcare facilities city and county officials, state offices, and the federal government. Although much of the responsibility does ultimately lie upon the state, the states, all levels of government play a role in this process. Vital records and reports originate with private citizens, members of the family directly affected by the events and are reported by their physicians, funeral directors, medical examiners or others. The responsibility of these individuals are defined in state laws and penalties for non-compliance are also provided by, by statute. Non-compliance or unenforcement is not a challenge in the United States today like it once was. The local registrar of each district, which could be a town, city, parish or county, are responsible for collecting records and ensuring birth and death certificates are complete and accurate before sending them to the State Division of Vital Statistics, which are then reported federally. The primary duties of the State Vital Statistics offices, which are often part of a Health and Human Services Agency like in North Carolina, are to develop and maintain state and local procedures for the collection of vital records to ensure the law is enforced and produce state vital statistics. The state office is the final stop before data is submitted to the federal government. Any last clarifications or corrections of records content should be done by the state. The National Office of Vital Statistics, now called the National Center for Health Statistics, part of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention is the federal component that receives copies of all birth and death certificates. This office is mandated to collect vital statistics from all 57 jurisdictions annually. They also compile and analyze the information collected by the states and publish reports that can inform policy decision-making. As we can see, the vital records movement took many years, centuries even, plus the ongoing efforts of scientists, politicians, medical experts, statisticians, and, and social reformers to, to develop a streamlined process for documenting these significant life events. They are used as legal documentation and proof of citizenship. The data from vital records helps to inform public policy, identify resource and public health needs. Today's statistics continue to offer value as they address ongoing and emergent, and emergent health crises, such as COVID-19 and the opioid epidemic. Despite of overcoming historical challenges, the modern system needs Continual refinement as new technology and data collection methods are developed. 
Even today, vital records are not always filled out completely or accurately, which can lead to poor quality data. Although they have become familiar in the United States and other parts of the world, there are still countries that do not have a comprehensive, a comprehensive registration system in place. According to UNICEF, one in four children under the age of five do not officially exist. This statement may, be, may seem extreme, but it demonstrates how valuable vital records are in today's societies. Without any type of birth certificate, it's difficult to protect the rights of children and, and assess and their access to universal social services. Today, we've provided just an overview of how vital records and statistics developed in the United States. As you can see, it has taken almost 300 years to get to where we are today. And I cannot stress more how important it is in genealogy to understand the world and the time in which your ancestor lived. So now Molly is going to show you tools to help you find documentation and thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Ben. Good morning, everyone. All right, so understanding the history, like Beth just said, um, provides a better sense of what types of records are available, what information they contain, and, they and the value they bring to your genealogy research, and where they might be located. So this part of the presentation will focus on search strategies for locating birth, death, and marriage records in the state of North Carolina. The resources and research methods presented are by no means exhaustive, but we hope that you are able to leave today with a few more tools under your belt. Okay, so when beginning your vital record search, there are several key questions you want to address, again, at the beginning and throughout as you're doing your search. What information exactly are you looking for and what do you already know? Just as the details found in federal census forms have developed every 10 years, so too have forms of vital records and the methods by which they are collected. Taking stock of what you already know will help expedite where and how to search. If you are requesting a birth certificate from the local register of deeds, you will need to know which date the birth took place, for example. And if you don't have some of that information ahead of time, you might be redirected to another agency. Uh, in our state's case would be the North Carolina Office of Vital Records, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. So in a case like this, you can put on your detective hat to dig into secondary sources that provide clues to these vital events. You also wanna ask yourself, when did the event take place? So as Beth mentioned, um, there are statewide registration years for each event. And you can see the chart at the bottom. Those are the registration years for birth, marriages, and deaths for North Carolina. As you will discover, there are some exceptions, but these dates should be used as a general frame of reference when conducting your search. You don't wanna spend your time searching for a record that doesn't even exist. But where can you look if you know your ancestors vital event occurred before these registration laws were put into place. There are numerous county, state, and civil records or records created by private individuals and not the government that contain information pertaining to vital events. These are known as vital record substitutes and a few of them will be highlighted today. Another important question is where did the event take place? And specifically for North Carolina research, which county? So many records were filed and preserved at the county level. Today, there are 100 counties in the state and the last counties were added in 1911. Those were Avery and Hope counties. So knowing the year a county was formed and which counties it was formed from is a good way to ensure you're searching the correct county records available for a time period. You can find county formation maps and dates online, including on ncpedia.org, North Carolina's online encyclopedia. 
And finally, knowing the laws and what was going on in society is particularly useful when researching ancestors from historically marginalized populations. Tracing an African-American ancestor might mean exploring specific documents that provide information about enslaved or formerly enslaved people. There are a variety of resources available for discovering vital records. The State Library of North Carolina's Government and Heritage Library offers abstracts and indexes, family histories, microfilm, online subscriptions and databases, research guides, and more to help enhance your genealogy research. The abstracts and indexes are typically um, in printed form and they can include information from tax and property records, court records, wills and estates, apprenticeship records, and yes, vital records for each county. They provide a summary of the information that's found in the original record, and they are great tools for starting your research and for locating that original record. And they're particularly helpful if you are going to also visit the state archives, which is on the second floor in the same building. You can search the library's collection online using our online catalog. Some of our online subscriptions and databases include Ancestry Library Edition, Heritage Quest, Fold3, and several databases uh, that provide access to historic, historic newspapers uh, for North Carolina as well as other states. Some of the resources are freely available online, while others can only be accessed with a library card. If you are a North Carolina resident or state employee, you can register for a government and heritage library card online or by visiting us in person. If not, you can also check with your local library. They tend to offer similar uh, subscriptions or access to similar databases. So the vital records themselves or copies of the records are usually held by the Office of Vital Records, the local county register of deeds or clerk of court, or the state archives, depending on the time period and the document type. So today we will cover which institution you can request vital records from. However, it's important to do a little homework prior to submitting your request. As I said before, uh, depending on the agency or department, you will have to provide certain information up front. Um, and there is a fee for placing a request through the County Register of Deeds, as well as through the North Carolina Vital Records Office. They have their own processes and procedures for submitting and obtaining, submitting an, a request to obtain copies of vital records. So you will wanna visit their website or contact them directly if you have questions about that process specifically. And also, we're gonna talk about the State Archives. So to determine what is in their collection, you can consult their county records guide, which is available on their website um, and is also in print at the library. And this guide lists what types of records are available for each county in the archives. And you can also search their online catalog, which is referred to as DOC. Lastly, another resource we'll discuss today is familysearch.org, which you might already be familiar with. This site is developed by the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and is free of charge, but you do need to sign up for an account. And their collection contains historical records and indexes from around the world. And as you'll see, they're a great companion to also searching ancestry. They have some um, databases and collection that you might not find on ancestry or other websites. So take advantage of the resources that will be discussed throughout this presentation. There is no one stop shop for every record, but today we'll give you a brief overview of how they are organized and stored. And although today's focus is on North Carolina, the same techniques can be applied when researching ancestors from other states. Look at their laws. Which year did they enact statewide registration? Utilize the libraries, archives, genealogical and historical associations of that state. And the National Center for Health Statistics website does provide a handy map with links to the vital records offices of each state and U.S. territory. 
One resource I would like to briefly highlight before we get into uh, the vital records is the North Carolina Digital Collections. The link is available at the bottom of the slide and in the chat. And this is available online and can be accessed without a library card. It's a collaboration between the Government and Heritage Library and the State Archives, containing over 90,000 historic and recent documents related to North Carolina. In particular, there's the Family Records Collection, which can be accessed from the homepage. And this collection contains Bible records, index marriage and death announcements, cemetery records, including works progress administration cemetery surveys, um, and copies of some of the genealogical research that's been donated to the library. So this collection just scratches the surface of what's available in the library and the archives. So if you don't find what you're looking for here, certainly um, contact us directly or search on our catalog uh, for more about what we have in the collection that's that may not have been digitized yet. So now we will get into um, some of the actual vital events. Um, so the first is the birth record and it's what we know today is the birth certificate. So again, these records were required on a statewide basis beginning in 1913. There were some exceptions, including the cities of Raleigh in 1890 and Wilmington in 1904. Even for individuals born after 1913, you might not find a birth certificate. As Beth talked about, it took several years before there was full compliance for the state. Birth certificates can provide a variety of details about a person, including their full name, date and place of birth, and the names, birthplaces, and ages of each parent. And it can include the mother's maiden name, um, their occupation and education level as well. Copies of birth certificates can be obtained from the County Registers of Deeds Office or the Office of Vital Records, um, and they are filed with the Registers of Deeds Office in the county where the birth took place. However, there were some cases where the record was filed where the individual legally resided. Indexes to birth records are available at the archives and the library, um, as well as online. And so Family Search and Ancestry, they provide searchable indexes of birth records for the year 1800 to 2000. And for the years 1913 to 1922, um, there are some actual birth certificate images on Family Search that you can look into. Another tip for birth records and all vital, vital records is to check the website of the local Register of Deeds offices. Some, like example, Mecklenburg County, have searchable indexes online for vital records. So you might notice that the indexes I just mentioned online on Ancestry and Family Search start with the year 1800 for North Carolina, and I just told you that birth certificates didn't begin until 1913. So that's because their indexes and their collections contain other types of records for example, um, what's called a delayed birth certificate. So if an individual was born before 1913, or perhaps they were born after, but before birth certificates became more popular, um, they could file a delayed birth certificate. The information on these records are similar to what's on a traditional birth certificate. Um, they can provide some additional information that's helpful for researchers. For example, if a woman filed a delayed birth certificate for herself years later, um, that delayed birth certificate could include both her married and her maiden surname. Delayed birth certificates go back to the 18th century and can still be filed today. And I'm going to show you quickly on Ancestry kind of how to get to that North Carolina birth record index and show you the distinction between um, a delayed birth certificate in the index and a traditional one. So I'm going to share my screen. Just a moment while I pull up Ancestry. Okay. So if you're on the Ancestry homepage, you can see if you scroll down, there is a handy search vitals right on the homepage. And so you can click on that. I'm gonna show you a couple of different ways to get to it. 
And you can apply what I'm about to show you to searching any kind of record on Ancestry, as well as Family Search. Family Search will have a different interface, um, but a lot of what I'll talk about is really drilling down into a specific collection and a specific location, if you know the location. That will help you um, so that you don't have to sift through many records. If you're searching someone with a, a common name, um, it will help you kind of zero in on the person you're looking for. So I clicked on the vitals um, card that was on the home page. And as you can see, that brought us to the birth, marriage, and death collections on Ancestry. And again, this is still for the entire US as well as other countries. So you could, you could go ahead and search here, um, plugging in any of the information that you have. Like I said, though, I'm going to continue to filter down. You can narrow on the right-hand side to birth, baptism, and christening. And I'm going to continue filtering down. You can see on the right-hand side, you can filter by location as well as by date. And this brings us to a card catalog, a searchable listing of all the record collections available. On the left-hand side, you can narrow it down to which state you would like to search. So I'll click on North Carolina. So you can see there's 20 collections that you're actually searching um, when you narrow it down to the birth, baptism, and christening records in North Carolina on Ancestry. A lot of these um, you can see are not maybe obviously related to birth records, but we'll talk more about that because these are some of the vital record substitutes you can look in that may provide the birth date of a person. But for this example, we want to focus just on the North Carolina birth index from 1800 to 2000. And for Ancestry, all of their collections, if you scroll down, it gives you the source information, as well as what kind of details are provided in each collection. Um, looking at the years for each county, you can see most of them begin with 1913, but some of them are even earlier. Um, so that would account for some of those delayed births that we were talking about. Another way to get to this page, it's a little quicker, and if you already have an idea of what you're looking for, if you've searched Ancestry a few times, you can go to the search um, button in the upper menu and click on that, and you can navigate down to the last option, which is the card catalog. And over in the title or the keyword section, you can type in exactly which collection you wanna search. So you can see that showed us the North Carolina birth indexes 1800 to 2000 only. So clicking on that, you can narrow it down further again to the county. For this example, I'm going to search for one of my ancestors who I know was born in Chatham County. I don't have a lot of information about this person. I don't know the year. Luckily, they have a unique name. So I am going to search for them just using their name, their first and last name. I've narrowed it down to the county. Um, and again, I'm searching only for North Carolina birth uh, certificates based on their index. So if I do a search, I can see that the first record, and there's only eight, um, but the first record matches pretty exactly to, to the person that um, I'm looking for. Under event type, you can see it's listed as delayed birth and the date is 1907. Again, this is just an index, so this is not the actual birth certificate, but if you go to the source um, next to the button that says detail, uh, you can see it's originally from the register of deeds. So, Delayed birth certificates can also be requested um, from the county register of deeds um, where that birth took place as well. Okay. So this brings us to birth record substitutes. 
So again, these records can be consulted uh, if you can't find an actual birth certificate or if you know they were born in the 18th century and a traditional birth certificate just would not exist. Census records are an excellent resource for determining the age and therefore possible birth year and date of a person. The age range of an individual was provided on census forms from 1790 to 1840, and the ages were given on census forms from 1850 until today. Um, again, keep in mind, people who were enslaved were not enumerated on the census until 1870, so not everyone will be provided um, in those census records. Other records you can search include military records, cemetery records, a birth date of an individual can be engraved on their tombstone. Um, you can search find, you can search find a grave, excuse me, findagrave.com, which is um, a way to search um, cemetery records in addition to some of the other online databases. Um, newspapers could provide a birth announcement. Alternatively, if there's an obituary that was posted that may contain the, the date of birth for an individual. Other documents might include private papers. So these were created by private individuals, again, and not the government. They can include letters, manuscripts, business ledgers, account books, things like that. And those are typically found in archives, special collections. Um, definitely check with universities. Their libraries and archives tend to have special collections devoted to manuscripts and private papers. The birth date of an individual can also be provided on the Social Security Death Index, which is available on Ancestry and Family Search. And another birth record substitute is what's called bastardy bonds, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So the practice of issuing bastardy bonds in North Carolina dates back to colonial times when it was still tied to the English crown. And upon the discovery that a child was born to an unmarried woman, um, the mother was questioned to determine the father of what was considered an illegitimate child. The putative or the reported father was then summoned to court where he was required to post bond, um, in other words, to pay um, support for the child. These bonds can give the name of the putative father, the bondsman, as well as that of the mother and the amount of the bond posted. Um, you may not find the child's name, but you may be able to use the date of the bond to estimate the birth date um, of the child. Bastardy records related to the bonds may also include presentments against an, in, me, an, an examination of unwed mothers and of mothers to be warrants to bring putative fathers to court and receipts for payments made on behalf of bastard children. North Carolina has an extensive record uh, for bastardy bonds for the counties. So the state archives has a collection of bastardy bonds and records from 1735 to 1966. And the title picture to the left, North Carolina Bastardy Bonds by Betty and Edwin Kamen includes records or abstracts and indexes of records um, for about 30 counties. It's available in print at the library and it's also been digitized and can be accessed on the North Carolina digital collections. Family Search also has a collection for the year 1736 to 1957. Military records like this draft registration card from World War I provide the day, month, and year of the individual registered. Um, so this draft registration card comes from the National Archives and Records Administration. It's available on Ancestry. Um, another great database for military records specifically is called Fold3. So death certificates also began in 1913 and usually provide the name of the deceased, their place of residence and occupation, marital status, name of their spouse and occupation, the date and place of death and the cause of death, um, potentially information about the parents, as well as the attending physician or midwife and the name of cemetery or burial place. They may be filed in the state where an individual died and also in the state where they were buried. 
Other than the date, time, and place of death, a lot of the information on a de death certificate is taken what is taken from what is supplied by an informant, which I'll talk more about in just a moment. Um, but these certificates can be requested again from the Register of Deeds or the Office of Vital Records. The State Archives does have a smaller collection through the year 1979. And um, they can be used as a secondary source, source for birth information. So this is an example of a death certificate from 1916 in Iredell County. So again, some of the information is provided um, by an informant who is usually a family member. They weren't always related, um, but even if they were, there's potential that they didn't know their relative that well. Um, they could be in a state of grief and just didn't have all of the facts. So keep in mind that information is not always accurate. If you have another record that states something differently about that person, it is possible that the information on the death certificate um, is not totally accurate. Death, death record substitutes, a lot of them are similar um, to some of the birth record substitutes I just talked about. Um, Beth talked earlier about the mortality schedules a little bit. So again, these can be used as a death record substitute. Ancestry provides an index and images of the mortality schedules for the years 1850 to 1885. And FamilySearch has the images for the year 1850 for searching. Um, they're also available again in the library in the forms of abstracts and indexes on microfilm. Um, and they provide some information about deceased individuals from around that time period. So the last vital event we'll, we'll discuss today is marriage. So there were different types of county marriage records in the state for different time periods. Um, so the one we know today is marriage certificates and licenses, which began um, around 1868. But before 1868, uh, it was not required for couples to apply for a marriage record. Instead, they could be married by their church using what's called marriage bans or bonds. Um, and these were notices posted on church doors announcing a couple's intent to marry. And if there were no objections, the marriage could proceed. This usually occurred in the 1600s to the 1800s. And unfortunately, few records have survived from this time period. Um, there are some existing records in the archives and on microfilm here in the library for Pasquotank and Perquimans counties. After 1868, marriage licenses became the only official marriage record in the state. The Office of Vital Records has copies from 1962 to present. So anything before 1962, you will want to contact uh, the Register of Deeds in the county where the marriage license was issued. So in between the marriage bonds and the marriage licenses kind of coinciding, you had what's marriage, you had what was called marriage bonds. So there was a law that was passed in April 1741 in North Carolina that set the stage for what are known as bonds, marriage bonds. And this lasted roughly from 1741 to 1868. These bonds were filed in the county where the bride lived and they list the groom, bride, date of bond, bondsman, witness, and the county. These bonds can be located in the state archives. There's a microfiche index available for all of the existing bonds that are in the archives with the exception of Granville County. Um, and this index, and since then there has been a, a separate index that's available for Granville County marriage bonds. But this index is particularly useful if you do not know the county, if you don't have the location um, where the marriage bond was filed um, or where it took place, where the bride lived, because you can search the index either by the groom's last name or by the bride's last name. Another type of marriage record is the cohabitation bond. So like other Southern states, North Carolina did not legally recognize marriage between enslaved people. 
When slavery was abolished, the General Assembly made provisions for the legal registration of recently emancipated slaves in the form of cohabitation bonds. While the recording of the marriages took place for the most part in 1866, they referenced the joining of couples living as man and wife, dating back to 1820, possibly earlier. And these records typically give the names of the bride and groom, the year, sometimes the month they began living together, um, and could also include the names of their former owners. It's important to note that the surnames in cohabitation bonds may not be the same as those listed in other records. Men and women may have changed their surname after emancipation, and some may have kept their former slaveholder surname. An excellent print resource uh, for research and cohabitation records in this state is the three volume series called Somebody Knows My Name, Marriages of Freed People in the North Carolina County by County by Barnetta McGee White. And this abstracts and indexes uh, cohabitation bonds for 54 counties um, in this series. Um, and you can find copies of cohabitation bonds in the state archives. So finally, this brings us again to some marriage record substitutes. Marriage information can be found on the 1850 through 1910 censuses, um, as well as current censuses today. This includes whether a person had been divorced or widowed. Um, if you're looking at military records, a widow's pension can include the name of the veteran and additional information um, to prove a marriage existed. And again, keep in mind some of the other vital records we talked about can also serve as a substitute record. The name of a spouse um, and information about them will be listed on a death certificate, for example. So as you can see, there are many avenues for discovering vital information about your family. We didn't even have time to get into um, the details of all of them. But in closing today, I'd like to leave you with a few extra research tips. Use spelling variations of names or nicknames. And when searching for female ancestors, search using their married, their, both of their married and maiden surname. Don't overlook the research value of substitute records and explore the vital records and secondary sources of siblings, other family members, and neighbors. Be aware that not all records have survived. Some were burned in courthouse fires or are missing or lost. And again, inconsistencies may show up across records. These documents and their indexes were created by humans after all, so they do contain errors and omissions from time to time. Verify whatever information you find with the original record when possible. And remember, not everything is available online. Not everything is available in the same database on Ancestry for each county and each year. So you may need to piece together your research using a combination of online databases, print publications, and records housed in local, state, and federal repositories. Finally, approach your search with an open mind and be willing to revise your search strategy and try again if you don't find what you're looking for right away. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you may have, and I'll turn it back to Francesca. Thank you so much, Beth and Molly, for giving us an overview of North Carolina vital records, as well as giving us a virtual tour of the North Carolina birth records available on Ancestry.com Library Edition, including some research tips for future reference that we will be doing on vital records. As we begin the Q&A section of our program, we encourage you to please post any questions you have for the presenter in the chat box. I, we are, as we're waiting for some questions from the audience, I was looking through the chat and there are some excellent questions or excellent points about uh, some vital records or birth records, related to birth records um, in Ancestry database. And Gretchen was saying that, for instance, Forsyth County is not available on that index on Ancestry.com, which 
that's where I had going back to the, there's not like a one-stop shop for all of the information when you are looking for North Carolina federal records. Can I add to that real quick? Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I went through it really fast, but that's certainly correct. And that's um, another reason why when you're looking at ancestry or, or whatever resource it is, you want to look for um, kind of scroll down to where it gives the collection information. That way you can see, wow, the county I'm looking for isn't even on here. Let me, you know, reroute. Maybe it's on family search. Maybe it's on microfilm only, you know, so definitely read what the collection includes. Most definitely. I know like that it can get kind of frustrating because you wish that you could find it in one place, but I know that's not always the case. Um, someone else was also recommending, um, Stella was recommending looking at local genealogical and historical societies because they may have um, published abstracts or transcriptions of county records like birth, marriage, death, and death and boundary bonds. And I know at the State Library, we have a lot of those abstracts available for people to view in the research room. So that was another really great tip. And you are able to look to see what abstracts we have at the Government and Heritage Library through our online catalog. Do I like to add anything else? Um, we also had a question from Grace. Do you know where you might find a divorce record from the mid 1800s, specifically the 1860s? She would also like to thank you so much for your presentation. Those should be in the county records for that time. And at one point, divorce records, um, early ones were, um, it, it was required to petition the state for divorce, but later um, it, it was in the county. And sometimes um, a lot of the state archive or the state archives has civil, or excuse me, uh, divorce records like by its own like collection but a lot of um, divorce records are also included in the county uh, minute dockets. So the information um, may be available in those various minute dockets, whether it's the Superior Court, um, 1860s is before court reform for that um, time frame. So you're gonna be moving like 1860s is going on to court reform. So that's probably gonna be like Superior Court. John, like when, excuse me. Sorry, go ahead. Um, did, you, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was going to um, address John's question about where you can find the census for agriculture and manufacturing schedules for North Carolina. Um, to do this, I would like to um, take control of the screen and show you all something. Okay, let's see. So, I don't know, am I sharing my screen? Um, you took control of the screen, but if you would like to share it. Yes. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and then you should be able to um, share your screen. Okay, so let's see, I've got a gazillion things open. I want you all to look in Ancestry. This is kind of to, to show you in many ways of what is not in Ancestry. If you go to the census and you go to the US federal census, down here at the bottom are some of the special schedules. So I'm going to go to the non-population schedules, which is where the agricultural and manufacturing 
schedules are. And if I choose North Carolina and I choose agriculture, I only get one choice of a decade for 1870. Not only that, I only get two counties. The fact is that the National Archives has in microfilms all of them, all of the counties for the other decades too that are not included, that more than 1870. And they do give people's names and they do give a lot of rich information. Unfortunately, this is it with ancestry for, for agriculture. And um, there also are limited um, years for, again, industry, 1870, manufacturing, we do have more, but, but we are limited. And um, so the National Archives has microfilmed those records and we do have them here. Um, sometimes um, people have indexed them and, and compiled them in books, but those are the only places I know where to get um, the complete records. And we do have them here. I do not know of them online unless they are in some place like Family Search. So Beth, um, just reiterating, if we if we don't have like access to Ancestry, um, you we do have access to these. Census, the agricultural census, the manufacturing census, as well as like the mortality um, census through at the state library, at the government and heritage library that we can access um, on microfilm. I'm sorry, Beth, you're muted. At this point, we're, we're, um, we do have them here. We're, we're not lending them at this point, though. On the library one. Because we are, um, the research room is closed at this mm -hmm. moment until, as of right now, to January 28th. Um, Timothy from, had a question about how is Fold 3 available? And in the chat, Victoria put in a link to our online resources. And if you have a library card, an SLNC Government and Heritage Library card, and um, you can access that using your library card number. Um, if you do not have the card but are but live in North Carolina, you can request a library card online. You can also see full three available at the state library when we are open um, in a couple of weeks. Krista said, so newspapers are a great resource for information, but do either of you know if when there was a requirement for vital records, say death or divorce to appear in newspapers? Did, uh, would you repeat that question? Of course. So Krista's saying that newspapers are a great resource for mm -hmm. information, but do either of you know if and when there was a requirement for, you know, death, uh, like, you know, death announcements, divorce announcements um, to appear in newspapers? Generally those announcements, um, well, at least for deaths are, um, are paid for. Um, at least they, they are in the, they have been in the 20th century. Um, if you all know Helen Leary's book, um, there is a section there on, on one of the pages, it does state which newspaper was more apt to carry any kind of announcement um, or, or obituary. Um, because we had papers at that time, um, often we had things like, you know, a morning and afternoon edition. There was one, and I can't remember which, which was more apt to cover 
um, that kind of information. And do remember that um, birth was a risky thing in, in, um, in our history. And so that made birth announcements um, come quite late um, because so often the child and or the mother would die. And so um, really obituaries and, and birth announcements and things like that took place um, in the 20th century rather than the 19th, unless they were a really predominant person or they were murdered or something like that. Um, so um, newspapers are good to find because you can at least read between the lines and put a person in a place and time if they're mentioned. Um, they still should be consulted, even though, you know, most of that information is 20th century. Annette um, has a question about what resources are available to Native American genealogy in North Carolina. That's a whole different subject. Um, It's going to depend on many things. Um, Molly, do you have any input? Um, I was just going to pull something up for that. Um, there was a special census for Native Americans at one point, but I believe, um, and I, I think that was 1910, and then there were special roles for those who were rounded up by the federal government. Um, and one huge problem with um, Native American research, especially in North Carolina, is that the census taker went around and they wrote down what they thought a person's race was or ethnicity. They, and so, so often they miss Native Americans. They may have put mulatto, they may have put white, they may have put but black, so that's a difficult thing. Yeah, and there's there's a few um, collections that are devoted to Native American research. If you haven't looked already, like Beth said, there are Indian census rolls on ancestry, as well as old on fold three, which we've mentioned a couple times. Um, Although it is known more as a military records database, um, they do have several um, roles and indexes and uh, pension files specifically for um, American Indian research as well. And you always have um, the option to email the reference team um, any questions that you have related to this topic or a topic that you're interested in and they can get back to you with um, answering your questions or asking more questions to figure out exactly what you're looking for. So Susan had a question about other states. I know we're focused on North Carolina, but you did bring about, you did talk a lot about, these are like, you gave some like research tips on how to find vital records outside of North Carolina, because it's like very similar. These are the types of questions that you ask. Would it be best to ask the state library if they have non um, population schedules um, in other states and other state libraries? Um, or if they don't, can they be requested from the National Archives? So if, if the state you're looking for, again, if it's not available online, um, I would recommend checking with the state library first, um, only because I know the National Archives, they get you know, requests from all over the country and the world, so it could take a bit longer for them to get back to you. Um, but I would definitely check with the state library and the archives of that particular state. I'm also going to share a link um, that will give you when a record started keeping um, I mean, when a state started keeping records.
There was also another research tip for the audience from Jim. Um, he made a point about the library edition of Ancestry um, has a subset of like the entire ancestry.com, the non-library edition. And he said that if you can look on their website to see what's available on library edition versus what's available on the regular edition. Um, do you know anything on, do y'all know anything on the top of your head that is, that's on ancestry.com but may not be on the library edition or? I am different? honestly not certain. Um, I, I have heard that there are things on the um, regular edition that you can get that are not on the library edition. But since we exclusively use the library edition, I'm, I'm not completely certain about that. And um, I, I think um, that's probably gonna be somewhere on the Ancestry website and I'll see if I can find something about that. Well, we are waiting to see if there's any more questions that are gonna be coming in. Um, I had a couple of direct messages and just wanted to mention those for the whole audience. Uh, someone asked about the list of resources that were mentioned in today's presentation. After this presentation, I will be sending you a follow-up email with the, um, to a link to all of the resources that were mentioned in today's presentation, presentation using the uh, email address that you registered with. And then once we have an online recording available online, I'll send you a follow-up email with the recording as well as resources that were mentioned. So if you weren't able to see the whole entire program or you came in late, um, you'll have access to that. And Beth put some information about the Ancestry editions in the chat box. I'm gonna give one more minute for questions. While we're waiting, I just wanna say there was so much more about the history um, that, that shaped vital records and um, things that happened in the census. I really wanted to tell you all, but there's just so little time to sum up those centuries. But if you ever wanna know, just give me a call or email me. There was, we had another question about how to research um, plantations or uh, about families that had enslaved peoples at their, who enslaved um, people in their community or on their land. Um, and they were just wondering, how do you research trying to find information about that. How do you research slave masters or plantations is what the question was. Do you want to take it, Molly, or do you want me? I'll, I'll start, and then if I leave anything out, you can okay. add to it. Um, there certainly are some plantation records you could search. If you want to research um, the people, the slaveholders, you would want to research their records. Um, and again, the private papers that I mentioned, that can come into play. Um, the University of Chapel Hill, their Southern Historical Collection, um, they have manuscripts and papers and letters um, from plantation owners throughout North Carolina. Um, 
some plantations in the state, for example, like Stagville in Durham, they you may contact them to see what information they have. Um, so you can search their records just like you would search the record of a of an individual as well. And I think Beth knows more about uh, exactly what's on the census regarding that information. Well, the agricultural census can give you um, an idea about because that's the agricultural census is not going to do just you know family garden plots which everybody probably had in the 19th century but um but they're going to cover they have to be of a certain size to be included on the agricultural census and so you may be able to find some information specifically about what was grown and the livestock and and the value and that sort of thing and and um and of course the, um, the slave schedules could help, but in researching the slaveholder, you would research mainly things like wills in the family, um, was an enslaved person passed to someone in a will, um, estate records, court, court minutes could include that because they um, often, have information about estates, deeds, of course, um, the transfer of property, um, and um, and sometimes even family bibles of um, slaveholders could sometimes include um, information about the enslaved, um, and of course the cohabitation bonds are are good for just after um, the Civil War. And in addition to that, I did just put in the chat a link to uh, UNC Greensboro Digital Library on American Slavery. Uh, so they're working on digitizing and making um, a lot of records searchable, like slave deeds and slave notices that were posted um, in newspapers. Um, so that's also you know, a good place to look to. And Kelly Agan um, also put in a link for UNC. Um, at Chapel Hill, their Southern Historical Collection she, that Molly mentioned. Tanya was saying that in Wilmington, North Carolina, um, they have a slave deed list on the public library's local history room website in the Register of Deeds office. And that's uh, that. Um, so appreciative of that comment because that is a good point that the state archives and the state library, we have materials from all over North Carolina, but there are local um, genealogical groups, local libraries that have their own family history room or uh, county research areas that might have more information that we may not have or the state archives may not have. And then another quick tip was um, you can also Google African American genealogy research or slave ancestral research and you'll get a ton of helpful links. We also have a lib guide um, for African American research that I'll, I'll send you the link for that too. And that might give you some, some helpful hints. Great. So it looks like we're almost out of time. Um, we're at 1229 and We also saw that North Carolina Gene Genealogical Society has a great resource too. There's so many great resources out there. And um, for all the questions that you have, please ask a librarian uh, through the State Library website, either through chat or through email. And we can answer any questions that we were not able to answer today. Or if you want to do a deeper dive um, into a question that 
we did talk about, um, please contact the reference team. They're fantastic and they know a lot about um, North Carolina records and can kind of guide you or direct you into the, the right point where you need to, we'll be able to answer your question. And thank you so much for attending our presentation, A Matter of Life and Death, Researching North Carolina Vital Records. We would appreciate you taking the time to fill out our event survey and give us feedback on this program. The survey link is on the slide and in the chat box. As we adjourn, please let's give a virtual round of applause to our speakers. Beth and Molly, as well as our chat tech support, Victoria Haas. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at future GHL events. Thank you, and happy.